Hello, everybody. So we have a crisis out there, or probably multiple crises out there, and some people like Blinkfeld Courier <laughs> think um, it's sensible to think about uh, some um, laws and everything that we consider to be given and being there, and that probably are abused by some other people. So, um, for example, the inter international humanita humanitarian law, and that's the talk that we will have to see what it actually is and what actually it's saying. So, what are the rules? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as I said before, I'm Blickfeld Korea, and I'm going to talk about the international humanitarian law. Um, before I start this talk, um, small disclaimer, first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so everything you hear is from a, more or less a layman that tries to make a little bit of sense um, to the given laws. Um, also, this is not the ultimate um, international humanitarian law talk because there is so much laws and texts and treatises that I'm not, um, I couldn't work through them all and make an... Um, talk in about an hour and um, does not make everybody's heads explode. So, um, yeah. Also, if um, someone sees that in the near future or so, and has maybe is a lawyer concerning the um, international humanitarian law, or someone from the International Committee of the Red Cross and wants to do a talk here, that would be pretty nice. Um, and you can do better than me, maybe. So, um, yeah. Um, we... Um, start. Um, what is the international humanitarian law? Um, does the um, international humanitarian law is basically a set of treatises and laws that um, yeah, govern how conflict should be, um, and or the rules that apply in conflicts. It's not the rules that state what we have to do when we um, start a conflict or want to start a war. That's another part of international law. And basically, the laws are here to protect. Uh, on the one side, some groups of people. Um, depending on what um, treaty or text we have, um, the um, group of people varies, and um, we see what those groups are. Also, um, it protects um, buildings and cult cultural heritage and other buildings. Um, more of that later on. And also, it restricts the means of fighting. What weapons can we use and what force can we use? Um, you know. Um, oh. Um, and one thing I have to say is that not all laws um, are equal. There are ones that um, are considered stronger and are then actually war crimes if you break them. And then there are laws that can, to some extent, be, um, let's say, stretched. <laughs> um, I'm going to look at um, the three big ones, I think. Um, first of all are the Geneva, Geneva Conventions. There are three of them. Then the uh, Hague Conventions, which is more or less um, all the laws that had implications during history, what we can use as weapons and what uh, means of um, force we can use. And um, I'm going to take a look at the, um, um, the protocols of the Geneva Convention. And yeah, so um, yeah, so we, um, oh, and also um, the international humanitarian law for the most part, um, is about conflicts between states or nations. In the text, um, they couldn't say for, it's all legalese, so they could not say, yeah, we have states or nations. These are always uh, higher contracting parties. So if I mentioned higher contracting parties, please be aware, I mean nations or states. I just use the terms because I'm used to it by now. Um, so there are other, I, I'm going to take a look at these three, four um, treatises. There are others. First of all, there are the commentaries of the Geneva Convention. If you, um, f uh, if you are a software guy and you ever implemented a language, then there's the, um, the text that says you how to implement it, and then there's the implementation itself and the commentary to that. And the commentaries of the Geneva Convention are that. They told you how you should interpret it, the um, Geneva Convention in order to make sense of what the actual words mean. And these commentaries can be quite extensive. They go nearly word for word. They, they comment on everything. If the text would say that the weather is nice, they would comment in which circumstances and whatnot. Um, the next thing that there are are the Nuremberg tri Tribunal, because that was one of the first where they actually had to 
um, take these treatises and law and um, speak law. So they learned as they go, I think. Um, and from that there were other um, trials and tribunals and with every tribunal and trial we held, um, yeah, we, we learned a bit more and what makes sense and whatnot. Um, then there is the customer, uh, customary IHL, which is um, they made a um, collection of laws that and rules that apply to um, local con or <laughs> customs that happen in war that are not written down, but for some reason people are following. And it's quite extensive, and yeah, so um, I skipped it. <laughs> um, then there's the start, statutes and uh, amendments of the International Criminal Court, um, because they have to speak law, so they also have um, their own laws and treatises who they use, and um, a collection of it. And then there are other conferences um, for certain other <laughs> conventional weapons. That's quite a nice title because um, it doesn't get any broader, I think. We should name that not. Maybe if we ever um, tired of the GPN, we should um, call it a convention on certain computer topics or something, just in the vein of that. And there will be others, I suppose, because as time went on, um, laws change, circumstances change, and so we must um, take care of that. Um, so, first of all, uh, Huh? Where am I? Ah, yeah. Um, hmm. My um, slides got mixed. So um, let's take a look at the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions are a set of three conventions. Um, and they also have, um, if you read the conventions, you have, um, for starters, you have some general parts. Then you have the more specific part uh, where all um, text is in that the um, conventions about, and then you have the closing. And the uh, general prov provisions are for all three treaties the same. Um, first of all, they have this clause that says you have to pay respect to the convention because this um, law should be something special, and so yeah, you have to show respect to the um, convention because... Yeah. Um, then you have the application of the convention where we just basically define um, <laughs> what's the use and where do we use it. EA, um, conflicts between two high contracting parties. Um, then we have, um, yeah, um, this is a um, big one. Um, Article 3 is mostly um, between conflicts between not um, internal conflicts because at some point they uh, said, well, there's not really a distinction between external and internal conflicts, but also um, the states are sovereign, so we cannot dictate what they should do. And that is, um, to try to um, negate that a bit, to say, hey, you can sign this and then maybe treat your citizen as, as not as bad as you maybe do. Um, then the field of application, what's the treaty all about? How, um, in what field of theater does it um, apply? Um, application by neutral powers, can other parties um, use the treaty as well? Um, special agreements, yeah, if you are two parties, you can, um, you are allowed to do treaties between you if you have a conflict, no one stops you. Um, you cannot revoke the Geneva Conventions. When you signed it and ratified it, yeah, you have to follow them. Um, protecting powers defines just, um, if you have two, um, two parties in a conflict, you want like a third party that um, takes a look at things and is a neutral party where both parties agree to um, if the party says you do something wrong, then the party is neutral, so you respect that and then legal, the legal actions can um, go forth from that. Um, then they define the activities of the ICRC, also the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, what they do and um, what they should do, like care for um, all that um, injured, injured people and the uh, citizens and that. Um, Substitutes for protecting powers, they define that, well, sometimes if you have a protecting power and the protecting power turns out to be not protecting at all or a little bit bogus, um, there are rules in place where you can say, give me another protecting power, um, switch them around. Um, you know, and cancellation of procedure, do I have something to that? No, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, um, 
Then there are the endings. The ending is just bureaucracy. Maybe uh, the, um, the ending of the Geneva Conventions just say uh, the texts are or originally in English and France, uh, French. Um, so that are the languages that are um, the treaties are written in. That that are the languages you should use because they are the most precise. If you have a translation, then it might be get a little bit um, rough around the edges. Um, there are translations, and there are um, I. I think a few articles concerning translations as well. Also, there are the signatures. Every party um, following the Geneva Conventions has to sign them. Then they have to uh, then they have to uh, then they have to um, ratify them. The uh, ratification is stored in Bern. Um, um, then we have a clause um, coming into force um, that um, basically says, "Hey, um, as long as two parties are ratified." Um, you have six weeks and then the um, Geneva Convention, the specific Geneva Convention is in order. And um, accession is um, who can be a third, uh, um, a higher contracting party, who can join or um, follow the Geneva Convention. Basically said every um, um, yeah, higher contracting party, um, nation state, um, can, be, um, can be joined the Geneva Convention. Also there are, uh, in some cases, are um, how to, to say that, um, they sign it, they ratify it, but they are not quite um, content with the, um, what the um, convention says, so they, they wrote their own comment, and yeah, that might be interesting later on. So, we, uh, bup, 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 bup. Um, let's start with the first Geneva Convention, the Geneva Convention for Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Armies on the Field. That was the first one to be created um, by, um, or, the first one who started this was Henry Durand, who went to or who saw the aftermath of the Battle of Solferino, and what he saw was so horrific that he said, "No, there must be there must be something we can do." And out of that, he um, or he was then one of the creators of the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Geneva Convention, just because the battle was so horrific. Um, they are free. And uh, mostly the Geneva Conventions are about protecting people and places, weapon, total, other text and treaty. So um, the first Geneva Convention, the original one, had just a few basic points. First of all, um, how you treat it or um, what do you do with captured and uh, who can you capture? And so if you, if you are out of battle, if you're wounded or you're a civilian, then that's maybe not, yeah, you should care, be careful, cared for, no? Um, you know, and the treatment you receive is impartial, means that no matter on which side you're on, you get treated because you're wounded and you need help. Um, also, um, the civilians and the medical personnel, you won't, no, you don't tell them ever, 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 um, because they treat your soldiers if they're wounded. And um, we, ha in the original text, at least, the um, Red Cross is a protective symbol. Means you paint it on a building where you're um, wounded or treated. And that's a no-go. You, you don't attack that building because it wears this protective symbol. There are other symbols that will come in um, reminded for later. Um, also, the Red Cross is... Um, you should only use this as protected symbol. The Red Cross is a um, trademark of the International Committee of the Red Cross. So in, um, in daily life, you should not use it because copyright protection and also because it's a protective symbol and you just want to use it in that specific purpose because this is the meaning and should not be a daily use because it's something special. It protects those who need it. Um, then they amended it later, um, late in later revisions. Um, uh, some articles dealing about um, the sick and the ev evacuation of the sick and wounded, um, which ev evacuations you can do, which you can do not. Um, then you have retained personnel. If your personal, uh, medical personnel gets captured, um, they usually have to be returned to the, um, their country and their side of the conflict, except Veterinarians, they are out of luck. Um, there is a, um, in the sources of my talk, there is an um, other talk linked, a um, video from an US Army um, 
uh, I don't know what his rank is, um, who talks about um, this stuff uh, for um, medic personnel is quite interesting and it goes a little bit deeper because they ta also talk about um, if you are medical personnel, you're not allowed to um, attack or wear weapons and what is if you get captured and you cannot go back to your to your site, can you flee, what do you do? It's quite interesting, but it would be too long to mention it all here, so if you're interested, look at the source. I load up the um, slides later. Um, you know, um, also um, one topic is um, recording and forwarding information. You have to establish um, means of get information and um, recordings of your captured, uh, of your wounded person back and forth to conflict. So they can, um, you know, oh, he's missing. Maybe we should do something about it. Um, and then prescriptions regarding that. Um, that that should, should not be cremated and they should be probably ID'd. Um, yeah. Um, and there's more, but in, I have to paint relatively broad strokes because the talk gets longer and longer and more complicated. Um, we have a few uh, conventions to um, wade through. Um, at, at, at the end of every convention I um, talk about, there will be grave breaches. Grave breaches are the um, slightly um, beautiful term for the, uh, of the Geneva Convention for war crimes. Um, and I think that's important enough that I quote the full thing here. Um, I don't, uh, should I read it? Grave breaches and, um, to which the preceding article relate, relates shall be those in, involving any of the following acts if committed against persons or property protected by the convention, willful killing, torture or inhuman treatment, including biological experience, willful causing great suffering or serious injury to body and health, and extensive destruction and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawful and wantonly. Um, if that happens, that um, as far as I could, um, could find out, the uh, um, procedure goes as follows. If one side thinks that a great breach happened, they inform the protective powers and the protective power then launch an investigation. And if they come to the conclusion it has happened, then they round up the suspects meaning the people who committed them and who commanded them, and they can then um, bring them to trial in their own, um, under their own laws, or they can commit them to um, a court in, uh, of another um, high contracting party, which might be um, the case of attrition in The Hague. Um, that's how, um, what I read, but I'm not quite sure if that's 200% accurate, so you take it with a grain of salt. Um, the second Geneva Convention is something like, um, came next to the first, is a little bit like the ready meal of Geneva Conventions because, you know, just at water. It's all about marine warfare and it's basically the same to some extent um, of the first one, um, just for marine forces. Um, all parties must protect and care for wounded sick and ha, water shipwrecked. Um, and yeah, we care for the wounded shipwrecked. Um, and, and yeah, if, you know, it's a body of water, so we need um, maybe need neutral vessels because we have not enough capacity or tonnage to um, get all who swim there in the water after our attack to safety. So we can uh, ask neutral vessels if they want to or if they pick up um, the shipwrecked. And maybe it's, it's a good thing if we don't attack the neutral vessels. I mean, come on. Um, and the uh, religious and medical personnel, as said with return, as a, Medical personnel always has a um, protective status, so we cannot, um, yeah, we cannot just um, attack them or c take them captured. But we can c take captured the uh, wounded and sick on the ship. Um, that's a little bit of a bad idea, as we see in the next uh, Geneva Convention. Or oh, so I think. Um, yeah. Also, um, Article 51, uh, grave breaches of the Second Geneva Convention. Um, as far as I, I, I just flipped through both tabs of my browser and they seem ident identical with the first one, so I will not read the whole thing again. Um, the third Geneva Convention, um, time marches on. We, um, uh, we see that we have um, the medical personnel and we treated the wounded and sick, and then suddenly we come to the conclusion, oh, we have, um, maybe we have prisoners of war, how we treat them. Um, what are prisoners of war? Who can be have the protective status of um, a prisoner of war? Armed forces and militias, and 
volunteer corps, including organized resistance movements. Ha! What they do they need to get this protected status? They need a person who is responsible, a commander of some sorts. They must have as all military forces as a distinctive sign. If you are in a conflict, you must wear a distinctive sign. Otherwise, you violate the Geneva Convention. Um, you must carry your arms openly. And of course, you must follow the laws of the Geneva Convention and the international uh, humanitarian law, because, yeah. Um, prisoners of war can also be um, civil personnel who have support roles in the army, merchant and mar marine crews of civil aircraft and ships, and <laughs> inhabitants of non-occupied territory who spontaneously take up arms, because, yeah, they take our land. We just not sit idle by. Yeah, you're protected. Um, and, oh, yeah, um, <clears throat> the um, POW are protected from the time captured till, they are, um, uh, till the conflict's over. Um, when you are in doubt if someone is a POW or not, then he is a POW until the tribunal can settle the matter. So, protected. Um, also, your retained medical personnel and your chaplains um, take precedence over all other um, POWs in treatment. Um, yeah, so... That's that. Next step. Um, the POEs are responsibi responsibility of the state, not the person who captures them. They can be not transferred to a state that's outside of the convention. Uh, it's not a party of the convention. They can only transport to high contracting parties. <laughs> they must be treated humanely, and they, their medical need must be met. If you remember the slides to three minutes ago about ships and that you can capture the, um, the wounded and sick on that ship. Why would you do that? You have to care for them, you must then treat them humanely. If they are already on a vessel that helps them, let them. Um, so, what do you, um, what says the Geneva Convention about captivity? Um, don't mind the bracket, that slips through. Um, what information must you give? Um, <laughs> Some bad action movie uh, might already mention that, of, maybe you know that. Um, sure name, first names, rank, date of birth, and army, regimental, personal, or serial number. Um, you can now use physical or mental torture, not prohibit. Um, they have to allow external relations. You have let them send and receive posts, and their family can talk to them. Also, um, <clears throat> There are, uh, you know, um, bum, bum. there are also regulations what private property can a POV keep. A POV must evacuate, uh, evacuate it from the com combat zone as soon as possible. And then they regulate all um, matters of things that occur during internment, like what, qual what quality of quarters do we have, food, clothing, oh, they must protect hygiene and medical attention. The um, medical personnel and chaplains, how are they treated? As I said, they must be returned as soon as possible to their side of the party. Um, religious practice has to be allowed and um, intellectual and physical activities um, must be provided. If you provide physical activities, um, uh, discipline and military rank must also provide. Um, if you provide intellectual and physical activities, they also regulate what kind of work do you can um, <laughs> force or what, what kind of uh, work um, POW can do, um, and can they be paid, or what are their monetary rules in the POW camp. Um, also, there are relations of POU, uh, POWs with the exterior world, as said, um, post is allowed. If the post gets censored, um, they must be censored quickly. And also, um, you have to uh, establish something like um, a committee, committee of PO, the committee might be the wrong word, but um, 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 an interface between the POWs and the um, power that captures them so that disputes can be uh, talked about, like, uh, or, or accommodations are uh, wet and not hygienic enough, and maybe please um, give us more food. Or everything that creates friction and has to be solved can be done solved to the, this committee. Um, the rest of the third Geneva Convention talks about the term, termination of captivity um, when other prisoners released, EA, 
when is the conflict over, if it's too sick and must be transferred elsewhere, etc. Um, there is the Information and Relief Society for POWs that takes care of a few um, external things like uh, help and care packages and so on. And the execution of the convention, that's a um, leftover from my um, creating process of the slide, the execution of the convention, you remember the first uh, series about the ending of all conventions, that's the execution, is part of that. Um, the uh, third um, grave breaches um, is more or less the same as the first two, except that they're also mentioning that you cannot, um, uh, b -b 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 where is it? Serve in the forces of a, a hostile power, um, will, willfully depriving a prisoner of war of the rights of a fair and regular trial described in the conventions. Basically, it's the stuff from the first one for POWs plus some extra rooms. Um, the fourth one is uh, a step further. Um, now we have, uh, now we don't have um, POWs, but we take a look at generally um, the civil population of a conflict. Um, <clears throat> um, part two is about um, how, do, uh, what um, means do we have to protect um, this, um, the civilian um, population of a conflict. We have um, hospitals, which we learned have uh, this protection sign. Um, if we are so inclined, um, the high contracting parties in the conflict can say, yeah, we um, both recognize certain neutralized, neutralized zones where we don't attack. Um, general, the wounded and sick are um, protected, meaning you don't shell them, you don't shell the transports, the um, first aid vents, etc. Um, you, uh, you, it should be possibly that you can evacuate the sick if they need to be evacuated. Um, as I said, hospitals are protectors, are protected. Um, bum, 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 bum. Um, hospital staff has to wear ID, uh, ID cards and can be identified identified so that you don't shell them. Um, you have to let medical supplies through. There are a few exceptions if you are suspicious that they don't um, arrive at where they are needed. Um, but in general, you must let them through. Um, also, um, you know, they, are, um, they are protected, the hospital staff is protected. Um, there are rules for land, sea and air transport. Um, you don't um, attack uh, land and sea transport. Also, um, air transports have to uh, fly in a certain corridor, meaning uh, at a certain height, at a certain um, route, and are also off limits for attacks. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned it, uh, whoops, uh, foot and clothing and medical supplies should be let through. Um, there are measures regarding child welfare, uh, child welfare, child welfare. Thank you very much. Um, if you have orphans or childs who don't know where their families are, you have to care for them. You must do at least attempt to try to find their family. And um, yeah, um, you have to let f personal letters through and family news through so that people can inform themselves where their relatives are and how they're doing. And dispersed families is the same as um, child care, I think. Um, yeah, next part is persons. Um, <laughs> that's a neat one. Prohibition of corporal punishment. Um, if if someone does something wrong, you know, say you are you have um, occupied an, um, an an area, you cannot just um, stand to PD, um punish all people are there just because are there and they look suspicious. Um, no, um, just the person who really really did the thing. You have a punishment. Or you, um, yeah, that, that, that goes, that, no, 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 um, corporal punishment, for short. Um, everyone is individual, individual responsibility for her actions and only individuals can be punished and to a certain degree you cannot torture them, for example. Um, and pillage and uh, our reprisals are also be forbidden. Um, there is somewhat of an, um, there are articles about um, transfers and evacuation. You cannot just because uh, you want just deport all of the inhabitants of an um, zone, of an um, occupied zone, um, and you cannot um, deport, say, um, parts of your populace into the occupied zone. 
Um, dum, 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 dum. You know, also unnecessary destruction of uh, enemy, property, uh, enemy property is also forbidden, and you must take care of children. Yeah, property destruction is forbidden, and you must take care that the um, basic necess necessities of the um, of the daily life are met. So you um, must um, provide something like you know a little bit of uh, electricity and water and so on and so forth. Um, you can <clears throat> uh, interment people, um, but they have a right to a fair trial and the right to appeal. Um, these are the great breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Um, um, time is a little bit short, um, so I will skip them. Um, yeah. I just leave it up for a moment. Maybe the um, it mentions the regular ah, mouse. Um, it mentions the regular trial and willfully depriving a protected person of rights of fair and regulated trial, taking hostages, extensive destruction and appropriation of property. Maybe um, just all things I talked about earlier. Um, the Geneva Conventions, as you heard so far, are all of protecting people. Now the fun part begins now. Um, we talk a little bit about um, weaponry and why we not use them. Um, the first um, treaty that um, has that as a topic was the Hague Convention in 1899, um, <clears throat> proposed for, um, by Tsar Nicholas II, uh, the, the second, sorry, and um, influenced by the Liber Code. That's an, Amer uh, that's an um, code that, or a law, regarding um, weaponry and so forth that was signed during the American Civil War by Lincoln. Um, they um, have such topics like the settlement of international disputes, <clears throat> then the laws and customs of uh, war and land. Uh, I mentioned certain things that are not um, um, not um, concerning weapons at all, but they are in, in the treaty, so I mentioned them. Um, we also take a look at marine warfare because, yeah, 1899 flying was a little bit off by then. Um, except balloons. <laughs> um, you find a, yeah, they, they, they were afraid you, you drop something from a balloon, but they barred it for five years. You couldn't use um, bombs for five years by, by, um, by dropping them by balloon. After that, that's off. Um, you cannot use um, projectiles with the sole object of spread as phys <laughs> as poisonous gases. There is um, later on there is a um, protocol to the convention that goes in a little bit deeper, and um, we can not use soft um, bullets or bullet that expands, meaning a dum dum weaponry. Um, yeah, that was the first Hague convention. The second um, was um, initiated by Theodore Roosevelt because the Russian and the Japanese were at war, and that, yeah. So let us talk about it a little bit further. I cut the um, topics a little bit down because not all. It was mostly um, topics from the first slide. Um, so they take, took a look at um, conversion of merchant ships into warships. Um, laying of automatic submarine contact mines was a thing back then that they had to talk about. Um, bombardments and a lot of m m uh, maritime stuff. Um, also, they established the International Prize Court and um, also balloons was still a thing. Um, those are just the basics. The um, convention on certain conventional weapons is much deeper, as mentioned earlier, but I wouldn't want to bore you with that, so if you want to look it up. Um, in the sources, there are the um, International Red Cross has a database of all treaties and um, texts uh, concerning the uh, international humanitarian law, where you can find all that thing. Also, the commentaries. Have fun. Um, it's worth reading. Um, there is the Geneva, pro um, proto the so-called Geneva Protocol, um, which um, talks a little bit about um, not using poisonous gases and bacteriological warfare. Um, some person took a look in 2002, as I recall. Um, when you read the title, it's all fine, and then you start to think for a moment. And um, it has a little bit of a shortcoming. 
they not prohibit um, the use uh, against not ratifying parties, which uh, a bad thing, not the nicest thing you can do. Um, it's not prohibited to use them as retaliation, so as long as you don't fire first, you are fine. Um, and research uh, on those weapons also not prohibit, and so you can say, oh, I'm, I'm just researching, I'm just researching and stockpile them. That's yeah, it's a first good step, but it's maybe not the not the end. Uh, not you, you should work on that. Also, um, who signed? Many nations signed. All have uh, some of them have has a reservation, and the list is quite long. Meaning, so yeah, we signed, but we uh, not respect all of it, and that's also a bad thing in my book. Um, next is um, also that thing is called uh, at, at least to the Wikipedia uh, the article the Geneva Protocol. <laughs> there are three Geneva Protocols, and I really, really can't tell you what's the difference between the Geneva Protocol and the Geneva Protocols. So if someone finds that out, tell me. I'm really eager to know. Um, the, first pro whoop, the first Geneva Protocol is an extension to the um, Geneva Conventions. And it, also, uh, it just um, <clears throat> extends on the Geneva Conventions and adds additional rules. Um, some of them, it has 102 articles. I, I just um, skimmed through some here. Um, pro, uh, perfidity is prohibited. Like, prohibited. Um, uh, pilots who are jump out of their aircraft because they're in distress, don't fire on them. Um, the um, compliance, they clarify um, the identification of armed forces. Um, I just want to mention a merchant shall not have the right to be in combatant or prisoner of war, so they are not protected. Um, they um, outlaw and discriminate attacks on civilian population, destruction of food and water. As mentioned as the, um, from the other protocol, you have to care for the populace and um, must provide with basic needs, so this is more or less a recap. Um, you cannot attack infrastructure, dams, power plants, water treatment facilities, no go. Um, yeah, um, women, children, medical personnel, uh, special protectors, also journalists, <clears throat> just saying. Um, you cannot conscribe uh, children under age of 15, except um, if they do it voluntarily. Um, you know, um, also they all, uh, again clarify um, the status of um, guerrilla forces. They can be protected under the Geneva Convention. Same um, points as um, before, if they have a com commander where their identification, then they are fine out. Um, also, um, it's a crime to use the protective emblems of the um, deceiving. Um, you, you cannot t um, hide yourself behind a um, uh, protective emblem and then attack. No, protect, this is a protective emblem. It's for protective purposes only. You don't misuse them. Um, the second um, protocol is, um, I mentioned Article 3 of the Geneva Convention before. Article 3 is the um, article you have at the beginning that gives um, people in um, internal conflicts of nations some certain rights. Basically, the protocol, Geneva Protocol 2, is the same thing as the um, protection of um, civilians uh, Ah, where am I? <laughs> uh, just a moment. So um, it's just basically the same as the uh, Geneva Protocol for civilians in international conflicts, just um, for uh, internal conflicts. Um, might be an interesting talk just about that protocol and see what um, actually is used in the world out there. Um, the third Geneva Protocol uh, concerns the protective sign. You have a few uh, organizations that um, are protected, but um, regarding to culture and customs, they all have different emblems. And some of them wanted protection, but they were hesitant to allow the symbol of the organization as protective sign. Um, 
For example, Meg and David Adam used the Red Star of David, and for some reason, the International Red Cross said, no, this, we cannot allow it, or uh, we don't want to use that as a protective sign, so they came up with the Red Crystal. The Red Crystal is, see here, um, is a n neutral sign, and so you can use this for your organization. I think they allow that you have your own emblem in the middle, and yeah, so of a development there, so if you see this sign, it's the same as the Red Cross uh, when it comes to protection. Don't shoot at it, don't shoot at buildings that carry that sign. That's important. Um, last one, um, there is the hate convention for the protection of cultural property. And I took that into the slides because it's a little bit underrepresented. There are um, um, cultural, say, um, statues and um, other museums um, that normally are or were not protected. If you see one of those, not all three, then you cannot shoot at them because they are cultural important for all of us. If you see three of them, um, they have some special statuses and um, the um, government on which land this thing stands has to um, take certain measures to make sure that they are a little bit better protected. Also, don't shoot on them. Um, I just want to bring it up because we always talk about civilians and um, um, POWs, but also, hey, we have a culture and maybe we should protect them as well. So um, that was it for the talk. I hope I, I bored you not to death. And um, it was I hope it was somewhat coherent what I talked about. Um, thank you for listening. If there are any questions, please. Yes. Uh, you talked about uh, the Red Cross and the other mm -hmm. uh, protective symbol. Is there any pre-established process to validate if someone is using them in good faith? Uh, uh, what, what does, uh, I didn't understand the last um, bit of the sentence. Sorry. Yeah. Someone could just put up the Red Cross on military. Uh, yeah, um, that, um, that I mentioned this. this, is, this is, uh, let, me, let me show. Um, it's a war crime to use one of the protective emblems to deceive the opposing forces. Yes, that, that would be in a, a trial after the conflict. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is what I mentioned. If, if that happens, the um, one contracting, high contracting party, good damn it, um, must go to the protective power and say, hey, we think there has happened something. Let's take a look, and then the legal, legal process starts, as far as I uh, know. Okay. More questions? Why would you need um, a special protocol for inner conflicts? I mean, because, yeah, because they, um, in the beginning, they only had, um, <laughs> for some reasons, they didn't care about the inner conflicts because the inner conflicts, a country is sovereign, so you cannot take. Um, an international organization or an outside party and dictate the, the uh, dictate laws that the country should follow. That's their stuff. They are, they are the country. Yeah. Between two country, it's countries, it's possible because they can, get, they can get talks going and yeah, you know, you give me that, I give you that. But internally, they can't, but they, they, they thought that they from the eyes of the um, affected, it's the same. So they, they made the uh, article three and the protocol number, well, what was it, two, to reconcile that. I hope I answer your question somewhat. But is it, um, is it different from the, uh, does it have different rules? No, but it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a different namespace, I would think, okay. if um, that makes sense. Or a little bit <laughs> uh, legalese namespace, you know. More questions? Who is responsible for enforcement of those rules? Um, the protective powers. As, as far as I read up, I have the same question, but I couldn't find out. The, the, the Geneva Convention always talks about in terms of protective powers. Everything that happens, uh, happens through the protective power. The protective power is is there for the special purpose to uh, take a look, um, to, to play the, um, the referee in this conflict. 
Um, if, if someone knows more, please make a talk. I'm eager to find out as well. <laughs> I didn't understand you. Sorry, there's the mic. Uh, usually, you, you uh, call the United Nations for mm -hmm. support and uh, the Security Council um, for a um, referendum, mm -hmm. and uh, they they concern uh, concern to uh, yeah. engage uh, because there are rules of engagement um, for intervene mm -hmm. or not intervene. Um, and the, um, it's a little little bit complex uh, yeah. situation. In but in the end, it boils down that the, they play um, the part of the protective power. If I'm right. Mostly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. More questions? I don't think so. So thank you again for this talk. I hope everybody learned something. Um, <laughs> I doubt that a lot of people actually have Just answers. so that people see, these are the sources. Um, the, cool. um, uh, if, if you um, have the PDF, um, these are the links to the d uh, databases, and the uh, thing at the bottom is the video from the US military um, talk about the retained personnel and what to do if you ever in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Blickfeld Kurier. Thank you.